Welcome back to A People's Guide to Publishing. I'm Joe Beal, the founder and CEO of Microcosm Publishing and Distribution. I'm also the author of A People's Guide to Publishing, which distills what I've learned from selling millions of books over the past 25 years. I'm Ellie Blue. I'm the Editorial and Marketing Director here at Microcosm. We are an independent midlist publisher based in Portland, Oregon. We have 14 employees, over 650 titles in print with 20 to 40 new books per year, and we distribute thousands of titles from other publishers. We started this podcast so that we can share what we've learned with newer publishers so that you can learn from our mistakes. Or maybe you just want to understand the publishing industry. This week we are here in Cleveland, Ohio with guest to the pod, Danny Kane, co-owner of The Raven Bookstore and author of the hit book, How to Resist Amazon and Why. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So why were you interested in writing How to Resist Amazon and Why? Uh, well, you know, the, the conversation about Amazon and small businesses and independent bookstores had been raging from the beginning of my career and presumably long before, uh, but it was almost exclusively a bookseller to bookseller conversation. And it was like, if this is ever going to get anywhere, we need to bridge the, 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 the gap of the cash register and have this conversation between us and, um, and customers. So the, the zine originally was designed to be a tool to start those conversations, to be so, something cheap you can just sell at the cash register so booksellers can begin to have that conversation. The, the, actually, the idea for the zine came from my friend Suzanne, who runs Maxbacks here in Cleveland. Um, she saw some tweets that we had and was like, you know, I think a zine would be really helpful with this. And so I was inspired by her. Of course, you guys came along and offered to help distribute it once I realized that doing it myself would require every night of my life being stapling zines by hand, so I appreciate that help. And then, you know, it turned into a book because there was so much more unsaid that I didn't get to in the zine, and if I had time and space to really explore this, I thought I could make the most compelling possible case. So the number one misconception I get from booksellers is they're like, I don't want to tell people everything they should not like about Amazon. I want to tell them what's great about my store and what yeah. I have to offer. So what do you want to say to them? Well, I mean, I would say I'm being a little bit of a salesman here, but the book is designed, the book is actually a pro small business book. And it's every other chapter is an interlude that from the perspective of a small business that does some compelling storytelling, I hope compelling, about the importance of small businesses and how they, they contribute to their communities. Uh, so it's definitely done out of love of bookstores. Um, and, and I really think of myself not as an anti-Amazon advocate, but a pro-small business advocate. That being said, you can't be a pro-small business advocate without talking about the dangers and risks of Amazon. It can't be ignored because people are, I mean, people are dying. People are, are getting injured, um, workers, Amazon is working really hard to kind of stop this nationwide labor movement, um, and they're big enough that like, that's, if they set their mind to it, that's something they could do. So there's a lot at stake, uh, but I do think it's important to balance that criticism and awareness of the dangers with a true love uh, and an awareness of the importance of small businesses and what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, you know, another thing that we run into constantly is like, oh, well, it's Amazon so convenient, like, I'm sorry, I feel guilty, I'm having all these feelings about how I have to support Amazon. And, you know, and I, so there's a weird factor there where people feel personally responsible for mm -hmm. Amazon's growth. What do you say to that? Well, I think the, um, it, it's a little bit like the climate crisis. As I've been working on the second edition of this book, I've been looking a lot more at the climate and Amazon's impact on it. But the, there's this idea with the climate crisis that, like, we will solve global warming if we all get the right kind of light bulbs, which is completely untrue. The problem is corporate emissions and, and, and nationwide policy. These problems are much, much bigger than individual consumers. It's true of the environment. It's also true of Amazon. And so it's like, I have decided not to spend any money with Amazon and work as hard as I could towards that goal just because of I like spending money with places that match my ethics. I don't think the solution to Amazon and their problems is is individual boycotts uh, because the problem is a lot bigger than that. Um, and, and Amazon is big enough that they won't really feel that unless it gets really, really big. The solution in the climate and Amazon is, is policy action. And so people can do a lot uh, 
to, to resist Amazon and try to curb Amazon by being in touch with their representatives, by keeping track of advocacy efforts. Um, and if, if they need to support, if they need to buy on Amazon because of convenience reasons or personal economic reasons, that's not the fight I'm fighting. I'm not fighting against those people. I'm fighting against Amazon's corporate misdeeds and the federal policy that has let them get away with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so how does, you know, how would you recommend somebody like bridge that gap in their own feelings? Well, it's the, the it, it comes back to being pro-small business. And I think one of the most resonant arguments I've seen, um, I can start that over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. One of the most resonant arguments from the book uh, in talking to people about it has been the idea that if you pull money from Amazon, Amazon's not going to feel it. But if you start spending money at a small business, that small business will absolutely feel it. And your single purchase might mean the difference between a, a, a day in the red and a day in the black for that business. So don't even think about Amazon. Think about where you are supporting. Um, and, and those small businesses, it makes a huge difference to them. And those are the people in your community, hiring people in your community, paying taxes in your community. Uh, and I think that mental switch um, is much more motivating. Yeah, and it's easier. I mean, and yeah. this is the thing that I've really pushed on people too, where, you know, I can say like, one person walked into our, our bookstore one day, and that was the, made it us able to pay our bills. Yeah, right. And that is, you know, which is like the low bar that we aim for, <laughs> you know? And, you know, and it's like, during leaner times, yeah, it's absolutely, it's like one person walking in and dropping $100 is substantial. Yeah. You know, whereas, yes, to Amazon, it's like, oh, we were down 0.001% this quarter, oh, who cares? Yeah, I mean, it's there also, they're, I mean, their retail, I, the, the, the most feasible way a lot of people can boycott Amazon is to stop buying things on their website, but their actual retail sales represent such a small portion of the money they make. They're making a huge amount of money with Amazon Web Services, their web hosting platform, and they're making a ton of money, even more than that, on third-party seller fees, on the fees that they gouge out of the people who are doing third-party sales on their site. And whether or not you buy on Amazon has very little impact on those revenue streams, and that's how they're shattering records every quarter, not through the retail. And in fact, a lot of ways they are already losing money on retail on purpose. Um, so that's I, that's a pretty strange way to do business. I, I wouldn't do it uh, as a small business. <laughs> like I can't imagine applying that to my business, but it's like we sell enough books, we can pay our bills and our employees a nice living wage. And like that's, that's our simple formula. And I think that's a lot more ethical uh, than what Amazon is doing. Right, right. We, we had the idea a while ago to get an Amazon Prime account and only buy really heavy things on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> like fireplace pokers, we, and we literally <laughs> bought um, flagstones. <laughs> right, yeah. Next day shipping for free. Mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. <laughs> it was pretty fun for a little while, and then you're like, well, then you, you know, the other trouble of Amazon that, you know, like the small business completely solves is like the thing you get is not as described, and the yeah. customer service path yeah. is very bumpy. Right. Well, you, I mean, you can't, if, if you get the wrong, it's impossible to get anyone on the phone at Amazon. I think we've talked about that. Uh, and, um, but it's also, I've done a lot in, in putting the second edition together. I went deep into just how deeply screwed up their bookstore is. And it's like, it is impossible to buy a specific edition of a specific book on Amazon. They lump them all together. And it's real trouble for, um, for publishers that are, are working really deep in the backlist and reissuing forgotten classics, like New York Review of Books or um, Valancourt, who does horror reissues. They're really lovingly crafting these backlist books and reissuing them with thoughtful introductions and good editing. And they get lumped together with really crappy print-on-demand because the works are in the public domain. And then Valancourt, their book, has a ton of negative reviews because it's like, I ordered this, and I, but it's like they're actually doing good and important work. And, and Valancourt has actually trimmed that program because of Amazon. And so that's important curatorial work that's not happening because Amazon's book buying experience is so bad and like that's that's not only a business problem that's like almost a free speech problem that's like amazon is so bad it is impacting what gets published like that's highly dangerous wow. um and so i spent a lot of time working on that um for the book but yeah i mean it's it's not just getting what you didn't order like that kind that that problem has really far-reaching consequences 
Yeah, I mean, and that's how I put it earlier today. I don't remember. I was talking to somebody, and I was like, it's not so much, you know, the problem of economics. It's more the problem of culture, where, like, you know, how do you even interface with your town? Yeah. Where do you meet people, you know? And it, But, yeah, I didn't even think of it in a curatorial sense, where, like, you know, in the old days, you know, not to be a 90s publisher, but, you know, people would say, like, oh, well, you know, you show an advance to Borders and you show it to Barnes & Noble, and if they both pass on it, the book often didn't get published, uh -huh. you know, and now that problem is gone, you know, and now, like, all of those stores have been ironically cannibalized by independents that replaced them by the numbers, but then Amazon stumped out so much of that market share right. that... You know, now it would be a problem like you're describing, where like if it's not able to get good traction there, some publishers would back out. Of yep, it. yep. You and it's there. I mean, in the book, the, the the new book has documented cases of that exact thing happening. It's not just hypothetical. Right. And so, what would you suggest to publishers that are relying too much on Amazon? Well, I, uh, it, it's really tricky. I do feel for the publishers. And it's like, at this point, Amazon has most of the book sales in the U.S. It's, it's now officially more than 50% of book sales are on Amazon. And it's like, I don't know what to tell them. Um, I, I would probably point to Microcosm as an example of a good... And it's like, you guys went totally independent and severed your relationship with Amazon and built your own warehouses and doubled your sales. So, like, it is possible. And publishers say, like, well, it's not possible to divest from Amazon. It's a terrible business decision. But it's like, well, I know I know these these bike guys from the West Coast that right. <laughs> and, and this is the thing, like, we run into this... You know, I, I, the Independent Publishers Caucus, you know, I mean, they had me come and talk. It was how I became a member, so it was a yeah. good job on their part. They said, Tom, tell us how you did that. Uh -huh. And, you know, and I, so, I mean, I, it was not a difficult spiel where I was like, our average month on Amazon was 1% of our sales. Our high mark was about 9%. So, you know, I mean, at a customer that small, it's not worth the terms they're offering. Yeah. You know, it's like if it was anybody else being like, we'll give you like, I don't know, a 30 year cover price. Does that work for you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you're like, but uh, I got to pay the printer nope. and I got to pay right. the author and yeah. we have to pay our staff. And, you know, and then I was like, how is this even a question? Yeah. But to the other, you know, I mean, I guess it's like if it's half of your income, you aren't looking at the fact that it's a third of the cover price. Yeah, I mean, it's it is it's a systemic problem, and I, I think the answer is is a more robust uh, and thriving independent bookstore market share in in industry, and it, that takes a lot of work uh, to build that. And it's I, I like to think I'm doing a small part to that work, but um, you know, it's going to take a lot. Um, but really, ultimately, I think the, the, the solution is legislative. And it's like, this is going to be a problem until Amazon is no longer allowed to function the way that they do. And there is, there's some good momentum on that. And there are some bills under active consideration, both at the federal level and in New York State, that would, that would go a long way to breaking up Amazon and kind of easing the chokehold on the marketplace. And that would do a lot of good things for workers and for small businesses and for publishers, because it would give them some breathing room and, and uh, kind of free them from the... Um, the, the trickiness of this Amazon bind that they're in. And that, I mean, you know, the call I was on the beginning of March, you know, it was it was strange because the, the general response was, that's easy for you, but it's harder for me because I'm so invested in this. You know, which I feel like it's this exact same problem that we were in with the chains 20 uh -huh. years ago, you know. And I, so, you know, I mean, I don't, I do feel like there's pretty easy solutions, which is like, <laughs> there are, tens of thousands of independent retailers that sell books. Yeah. You know, you don't need one bad bully. You need good relationships with the people that care about your outcome. Yeah, well, and it's, it's, that's just it, it's caring about the outcome. And it's like Amazon, they, Jeff Bezos got interested in books because they're easy to ship and he could stock more than Barnes & Noble. He's like, Barnes & Noble has 100,000, I can build a warehouse that has three million of these. Uh, and, and they're cheap and easy to ship, and they're highly organized because they all have barcodes and they're standardized. So that's the easiest thing to scale up. So he doesn't care about books or literature, about advancing, and it's, it sounds really wishy-washy when I talk about that, but like books are important. This is our nation's cultural legacy. That's how, that's how knowledge is furthered, is, is through books. And, and Amazon is not the, 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 they're not the people who are gonna guide that into the future.
it, it's more it's more bookstores and independent publishers and, and people who actually believe in, in this work of, of publishing and writing. And, and did you see two years ago as you know Amazon started to divest from books, they started to remove books from their warehouses? Did you follow that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 just that, and it's like it's not even a good book buying experience anymore. And they're so relying on third parties, and it's such a mess of like third party fulfilled by Amazon. It's like this is technically sold by a third party, but it comes through our warehouse and the customer doesn't know it's a third party. It's just a way for us to exploit that third party and get a ton of user fees out of them. Uh, and, and the whole thing is just a really big mess and I can't imagine anyone who truly loves books being satisfied with any part of the Amazon experience. Right. That's so good. how do we, um, how do we like support a thriving small bookstore ecosystem? Like what can people listening to this podcast do, whether they're publishers or uh, well, I mean, it's, it's find one to support. And it's not even like taking, you don't even need to take all of your book buying business to an independent bookstore, just some of it. Um, and like, that's the number one way to do it is just buy books or like as a publisher, um, develop a really good relationship with, with the indie bookstores um, and, and help them. And, and you could always just ask them what they need. Um, and, I, and I think it's not only, it's not just economic too, because there are small businesses and small bookstores are always looking for ways to spread their message. And so like even likes and retweets. And it's like, if I'm teaming up with a publisher to do an event, you'd be amazed at how many publishers don't help me with the publicity for that event. And they have huge followings and it's like, it's their authors, it's their book, but it's like, it's up to us to promote that event by ourselves. And so just like being on the same team as us with that kind of stuff goes a really, really long way. Um, and, and doing things in a way, or like if Amazon puts out a book um, too early before pub date, and like I've signed a strict affidavit that says I won't put this book out, but they do it. Like, don't let them get away with it. Like, don't be afraid to um, to to hold them to the same standard as us. Um, so, I mean, it's just like get in the door, show up, follow on social media, buy books. Um, we're good at what we do. We we love it. We take a huge amount of pride in it, and it's just like the more people we can do that to, the better. And then it's like the more indie bookstores thrive and get good press and become cultural forces, the more people will notice. That's why I love, I'll, I'll say yes to any interview anywhere, basically, <laughs> because it's like the more people read about this stuff, the better. And then it's like if, if people keep seeing the Raven in the news, they're like, publishers will see it too and be like, oh, you know, those guys are doing a lot. Um, and it's like, it's not just us. There are thousands of indie bookstores that are working just as hard. Uh, so it's just be there, be a part of the system and, and sign up and sign in and buy books and, and you know, let us do our thing with you. So what else are you going to put in the new edition? Uh, so it's, I've added a whole chapter on, on the climate, which gets into really important issues of environmental racism, um, which is a huge problem with Amazon. And as soon as I turned in the, the draft of the first one, I was like, I probably should have talked about the climate more. So I'm really glad I got the chance to do the second edition. But there's another interlude I'm really excited about that's about artists who are using Amazon as a medium to like cause trouble. Um, and so there's one, Kevin Killen is a poet. Um, and he had a long career in his poetry scene, but he also wrote 2,000 Amazon reviews. He's in the Amazon Reviewer Hall of Fame, and they're all like little poetic personal essays. They're gorgeous. It's beautiful writing. It's all over Amazon, and you have to like go to the bottom of these crappy products and see his beautiful reviews. And then there's... Um, there's another one, um, Angie Waller has done a lot of amazing work with Amazon, but she became like a print-on-demand bot. She, she started, she like all of these crappy print-on-demand books that are all over Amazon, she set out to figure out how to write them and wrote a series of books that are still up there. Um, and she wrote a zine called Grifting the Amazon, kind of outlining her uh, her process of becoming this like content bot for Amazon. And did, so, did you buy that zine on Amazon? I, I don't know. I bought it at a small business in town. I was at my friends at Wonder Fair in Lawrence. I bought it from them. I don't, you can definitely buy, you can still buy the Kindle crap that she put out. I don't know if you can buy, <laughs> but it's a good question. And so it's like, it's really interesting to see the, the line between art and activism and people who are using Amazon as a method to create art about Amazon. Um, it was really, really fun to write and, and research that. Yeah. And then it's like, I mean, almost every page has been updated or tweaked. I did a ton of editing. Um, a lot of things have happened in the two years since I turned in the first edition. 
Um, I wrote a lot more about you know this whole union drive in Bessemer, Alabama and Staten Island. That wasn't a thing when I turned in the first book and there's been hugely important labor issues going on with Amazon that I was able to, to devote the right amount of time to. Uh, so it feels like a much more complete book and I thank you for the opportunity to revisit it. I mean, I remember when you turned in the first book, you kept being like, oh, can I make this one edition? There kept being breaking news. Yeah, right. And it just seemed exactly what will happen with It's still one. a problem, right, because I was, I was talking to Lydia, who's editing it, and they were like, um, I need it by March 15th to do that. And I'm like, but the, the, the Bessemer Union election ends on March 28th. We can put the results in. And Lydia's like, oh, the printer is taking a long... I was like, let's finish everything except that, and then I'll add one sentence about how <laughs> so, I'm sure they're so sick of it. But it's really hard <laughs> to write uh, an up-to-the-minute, um, you know, non-fiction book, because I want... It's like things are happening so fast. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's a good thing. There's a lot of momentum and interesting things happening. Um, so, like, I'm... <laughs> Maybe. Well, I mean, it seems like they're not slowing down in right. terms of like creating news. Yeah. Whether right. they intend to or not. Yeah, <laughs> but like this time, I did. I was like, even if the info on this page isn't up to date, here's the takeaway you need to have, which isn't going to change. So I have a little bit of that in this edition now to kind of hedge off that problem a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, it's wild how much. I mean, you know, we joked in our office where we're like. The day it goes to print will be the day the biggest story breaks. I know, I know. <laughs> so it goes. But that's why you have Twitter and books. Right. So what are you working on after that, you think? Well, I have a poetry manuscript, um, so that that's still going. Um, and I, I think the a big question for me has been what kind of um, nonfiction book do I want to follow this up with? Uh, and this book has been successful beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, and it's, it's found a really big audience, and I think I owe it to that audience to keep this work going. Um, I would love, going back to a previous discussion, part of this discussion, I would love to write a positive book to focus on small businesses that are doing it right. And instead of like how Amazon is ruining the world, how these small businesses are saving the world, that I think. Sound very marketable. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the negative? Post? Yeah, I yeah. know. <laughs> but it's like I think it is important to tell the the positive stories um, and and to highlight people who are doing a good job. And so I don't have a fully formed idea or proposal yet, but that's kind of the idea that's been sticking with me mm -hmm. um, is to spend some time on on the folks doing the good work. Thanks for joining us once again. Please send your questions to podcast at microcosmpublishing.com so we can answer them on future episodes. And please give us five stars on iTunes and everywhere else that podcasts are reviewed. You can find us on the internet at microcosm.pub. On Twitter at microcosm. On Facebook at microcosm publishing. On Instagram at microcosm underscore pub. And here in Portland, Oregon on North Williams Avenue. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.